Hi, this is Dr. Kessler. Uh, our lecture today uh, is about multi-attribute utility models or MAL models. Uh, as you can see, uh, I've laid out the topics we're going to cover. We're going to discuss uh, when and why to use a multi-attribute MAL model, uh, how, ma how MAL models are different than a basic weighted scoring model. You might recall from uh, weeks one through three, I asked you to read the Excel uh, modeling uh, um, document and when you did your assignment one part two you actually had to uh, take um, a situation where there were uh, an Italian restaurant was trying to locate um, in one of three different locations and there were a number of attributes uh, across each location like the appearance of the location and other things and so you actually did a uh, a weighted scoring model uh, when you did that uh, assignment one part two uh, because you uh, scored each of the uh, attributes for each location uh, you weighted them you multiplied the weights times the scores and you discovered that location one which had a score of 380 was the best location uh, and so what I need to do is explain how MAL models are really different than what you did in that first example uh, we'll discuss the six MAL model steps, and we'll talk about uh, how to uh, analyze the MAL model results and how to do sensitivity analysis. So in terms of introduction, uh, we uh, tend to use decision problems or decision models uh, uh, when we have complex decisions. And you know this course is uh, really about uh, um, um, analytical methods. And so when we get to a situation where we have uh, decisions um, where we're picking between alternatives, like if you wanted to pick uh, among three different universities to attend, uh, such as uh, University of Baltimore, Loyola, and Towson, um, and then you were to uh, align a different set of attributes um, that you were uh, interested in for each of the universities, uh, that would be an example of uh, multiple decision criteria in a complex uh, decision situation where a uh, MAL model would make a lot of sense for you to use. Um, and you can think of lots of other examples. If you wanted to buy a car, um, do you want to buy a Ford or a Chevrolet or a Honda or something else? Then uh, it goes on and on. And there's examples here on this slide uh, uh, that offer the same kind of a thing, um, which are just examples of different decisions that need to be made with alternatives and different characteristics for each of those decisions. Um, I think what we need to do um, as we approach this concept of structuring a decision, it's just to recognize that decisions in and of themselves, uh, especially large decisions, big decisions, are complex. Um, there's trade-offs when we have, uh, we're trying to achieve multiple objectives. Um, there's uncertainty involved with the decision. We really don't know how um, a certain outcome is going to uh, turn out. Uh, there's lots of different perspectives which can lead to different conclusions. Uh, you may favor uh, American cars, and that's your perspective. And so you may weight uh, American cars higher, uh, whereas I may um, value foreign cars, and I may weight them higher. So we get these, these different biases and these different uh, perspectives um, that, that create complexity in decision making. Um, uh, you know, we also tend to approach decisions fairly seriously, like uh, you know, step one, step two, step three. Um, and we also have limits on how much we can uh, understand. When we start to get a lot of different alternatives and a lot of different criteria, the decision starts to get sort of large and, and cumbersome and complex. And so uh, what we need to do is use methods uh, for structuring decisions, decision analysis methods. And that's really what we're focused on uh, in this particular lecture. Now you'll recall from uh, the uh, uh, assignment one, part two, that you were asked to uh, work up a spreadsheet for Antonio's Italian restaurant. And you were uh, given three different locations uh, and then factors down the left-hand side. And you can see here that the factors include appearance, ease of expansion, proximity to market, customer parking, access, competition, labor supply across location one, location two, and location three. Uh, and then for each of these uh, attributes, uh, they were going to need to be scored on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being the weakest or lowest, and 5 being the highest or the best. And so you can see that each of the uh, f um, characteristics 
uh, was scored for each location. And also, uh, in order to make this model effective, we had to weight uh, these different criteria in terms of what's most important and what's least important. And that's what you see here in the factor weight column. You can see that they're, they've been weighted. And also note that the weights add up to 100. Uh, that's 100% of the total weight. Um, the next thing that you did uh, in your activity was you multiplied the 1 to 5 score times the weight, and that gave you this weighted factor score. And so you can see that appearance uh, for location 1 uh, got a score of 100 um, and so on. And that would be uh, 5 times 20. And so we multiply the factor weights times the scores, and then we get the um, weighted scores. And then with the weighted scores, we add them up, and we got 380 for location 1, 305 for location 2, and 340 for location 3. So uh, when you did that in assignment 1 part 2, uh, all of you were recommending that location 1 was the best location. Um, the other thing that we did in, uh, in uh, assignment 1 part 2 is we practiced using the max and the min features. Uh, we practiced using uh, how to do sum, summations. Uh, you can see here this is the max uh, function, the index and the match function, and on the next slide, the sum product function. Now the sum product function is particularly powerful because it enables you to cut out that second step. Uh, you can say, uh, using sum product, I'd like to multiply all of these scores times all of these weights and add them up to get this value. So it saved you that second step. So we learned sum product, which is a very powerful tool or capability. Um, so the question is, uh, why can't we just use that simple approach for all decisions? Uh, and uh, why do I have to learn something that has six steps instead of like two steps? And so the answer uh, really lies in the setup of that first problem. Uh, when you went back and you looked at that first problem that we did, uh, we noted that all of the factors, all of the scoring was qualitative, which means uh, it was an opinion, which means it was uh, uh, rated by someone on a scale of one to five. So the appearance uh, of each of the locations uh, was judged by perhaps a team or perhaps an individual, but basically after looking at the different locations um, and making a decision about appearance, uh, a score was allocated, and that's a qualitative score of 1 to 5. The second thing is that since all the scores were using this 1 to 5 scale, with 1 being the worst and 5 being the best, that we know uh, that they all have the same direction. 1 is the worst, 3 is in the middle, and 5 is the best. Uh, now, the thing to notice about the first problem was price was not included. Now, intuitively, you'd have to think, the price would be a very important factor in a location, and yet it was excluded. And the reason it was excluded was because that would introduce a level of complexity that the author did not want to introduce in the article that we were working with in weeks one to three. Um, so when we start to think about uh, adding quantitative data in addition to qualitative data, uh, certain things start to occur. For example, uh, one thing you'll know about uh, quantitative, um, quantitative price is that instead of the lowest being, being uh, the worst and the highest being the best, well, when it comes to paying for the price, in fact, lowest is best and highest is worst. And so all of a sudden, you've got, uh, you've got some of your criteria where the, the best to worst actually goes uh, from highest being worst down to the lowest being the best, lowest price. And so uh, what we notice is that price is quantitative, and unlike other factors where five was the best, the lowest price is optimal in cases where it's the lowest. In cases where qualitative data is involved, and especially when some factors are optimum, um, we really can't just use the model that we used before. So just recognize that when you have uh, numbers involved in the equation, when you have things that don't all move from worst to best, one to five, um, that you really need to, to uh, use a more complex approach, and that's what the MEL model is. So we have six steps here, um, and uh, I think uh, you'll see that the first few steps look very much similar to what we did in Assignment 1, Part 2. Uh, first thing we do is we identify all the alternatives. 
The second thing we do is we identify the evaluation criteria, such as appearance, cost, or whatever. Um, and then uh, we uh, actually score each alternative based on the criteria, whether that's a qualitative score, one to five, or whether it's quantitative data like weight or price or um, distance or some other um, quantitative uh, numeric kind of system, uh, we do the scoring. So steps one, two, three, we did in um, assignment one, part two, and you'll also do it again in assignment, uh, in the assignment on MAL models. I think that's assignment four. Um, and so uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, now we have some other steps to do as well, and I'll talk about step four in more detail because that's the one that's probably the most complex. And then I'll show you examples on PowerPoint, and then I'll actually show you the spreadsheet that I developed uh, based on your reading assignment. I would say to you um, that uh, if you haven't already printed out uh, the reading on MAL models for this week, uh, it would be a good time to do so and perhaps pause this video. Um, the reason is that uh, some of our discussion that we're going to engage in really uh, focuses on the content of the reading for this week. And so it would be very useful for you to have the article uh, at your side. Um, what we're going to have to do in step four, because we have uh, some criteria where the lowest is the best, and other criteria where the highest is the best, is we're going to have to come back and sort of take out this sense of direction. We're going to have to sort of build some sort of a method to make, uh, make the best be the best and the worst be the burst, worst, no matter whether the numbers are going up or the numbers are coming down. And so we have some work to do here. And so in step four, we're going to assign relative weights to the criteria. In step five, we're going to uh, rescale the criteria. This is where we remove the directional dimensions. Of, of each of the criteria, whether it goes up or down, we're going to put it on a scale of zero to 100 and, uh, and, and, rate, and get them all on a similar scale where zero is the worst and 100 is the best. So we're going to, we're going to have to take this, this step to put everything, whether, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, uh, and have it moving in the same direction. And then once we're able to do that, once we sort of convert all of these um, different uh, characteristics of, of the criteria into a consistent scale of 0 to 100, uh, we're going to be able to then multiply the uh, weight, the, the value, times the, the, uh, the weights and do something very similar to what we did in assignment 1 part 2. Um, this is just a, a delineation in more detail of step 4. Uh, step 4 is really the challenging uh, part and I'll go over this in a second. Uh, we're going to have to, uh, for each of the criteria, each one, uh, we're going to have to identify um, the best value for that criteria and the worst. So if uh, we're looking at something and uh, um, it has a score of 80, which is the best score, and it also has a score of 5, which is the worst score, and all the other scores are in between, we're going to have to pull out the 80 and the 5. So that gives us sort of like a range uh, from best to worst. Uh, we're also going to have to rank order the criteria. Uh, we're going to have to say which of the criteria is most important, next most important, next most important, and which is least important. Uh, we're going to uh, do a couple of techniques here that you'll read about in your reading for the week where we're going to um, assign weights to uh, the uh, different criteria based on their rank order. And I'll talk about how to do that. Uh, we're going to... Uh, push those weights all down onto a, a unitized scale, and I'll show you that in a second. Once we do that, we're going to rescale the criteria scores. We're going to multiply the scores times the weights, and we're going to get the best alternative. Okay, so in your article, um, you're reading for this week, uh, our example is uh, selecting popcorn. You know, it's a nice, simple thing to do. Uh, you see uh, in the example here and in your reading that there's different popcorn brands here, Newman's Own, uh, Orville Redenbacher's Gourmet, and so on. Um, and so the first steps, steps one through three, look a lot like what we did in assignment one, part two. Uh, we come up with the alternatives, we come up with the different criteria, we score the different criteria, and we're ready to begin our analysis. Uh, notice that uh, the criteria for popcorn includes the cost per serving, 
the calories per serving, the sodium per serving, the percentage of the popcorn that's edible after you cook it. You know, you know, you put it in the microwave and it comes out and there's uh, some uncooked kernels at the bottom. So this tells you which percentage actually turns into popcorn and which percentage remains as kernels. And then sort of a subjective scale here, uh, which was um, created by a taste testers uh, score of the quality of the taste for each of the brands. Uh, now, the only thing uh, I want to mention here is that serving cost, uh, when it comes to cost, less is better. So in this case, uh, the lowest cost is the best cost. So 21 cents per serving is better than 27 cents per serving. For most people, uh, calories, uh, lowest calories is the best. I mean, if you're trying to gain weight, I guess that wouldn't be the case. But for most of us, we like to have the lowest calorie popcorn. Uh, sodium is not good for us, we know. So we like the 115, which is the lowest sodium content. Um, the worst sodium content looks to be Betty Crocker at 209 milligrams. Um, the percentage edible, uh, it looks like Betty Crocker uh, comes out with the best popping ratio. Uh, and then finally the taste, and the taste uh, rated by the taste testers, blind test, uh, was 30.5 for Newman's own. So you can sort of see that, uh, that the scales, the taste actually, uh, the highest score is best. Uh, the percentage of edible, the highest score is best. But for the rest of these, the lowest score is the best. So we've got this problem I mentioned earlier, where we've got two of the attributes that move from uh, um, lowest being worst, highest being best. Then we have three attributes that move from highest being the worst to lowest being the best. So this is the example in your reading for the week. That's why I suggested that you have the article with you. Um, and so we go through um, the uh, process of building our table in Excel, which we just showed you on the previous slide. The next thing we need to do, as I mentioned before, uh, for, for uh, the each criteria, is we need to figure out the best score and the worst score. Uh, and so you can see uh, we've created a couple rows here. This row says the best uh, assessment, and this one says the worst. Uh, now remember we, used, uh, we learned max and min. And I'd like for you, when you do your activity this week, to be using the max and the min features of Microsoft Excel. And so all I have to do in here, recognizing that, that the lowest cost is the best, is I use the min, min feature of Microsoft Excel here, uh, and I get the lowest cost of 21 cents. And for worst, I use the max feature, I get 27 cents. And notice that 21 is the lowest, and 27 is the highest. And I use that same method all the way across. Once I do that, I copy the cell and I paste it across, right? And uh, so my lowest score here um, is again a min score of 83, and my worst score is the max score of 195. Like I said with sodium, minimum sodium is 115, best, that's the best criteria. And then the maximum sodium um, is the worst, which is the worst criteria. Okay, now I've got to kind of flip that logic a little bit, right? Because now for percent edible, I got to say the best one is the maximum. So there I get 94%. And the worst one is the minimum in terms of percent edible. And then for taste, I do the same thing. The, the, I maximize the taste in order to get the best taste, and I minimize the taste to get the worst taste. Okay, so you can see that I've created those criteria. Now the next thing that we need to do uh, is we need to rank order the criteria. We need to decide of these five criteria, uh, which one is most important and which one is least important, and we need to, to have them all ranked. Um, and this is uh, really important, and it may change depending on your decision maker. Um, I would involve your decision maker in this process uh, if you're the analyst doing this for someone else who has to make the decision. And so, you know, because what's important to that person? So for, for me, and, and if I was a decision maker, certainly calories would be the lowest, uh, would be the most important. That's highest rank, number one. And the cost is the lowest, especially when dealing with something that's not that expensive like popcorn. Maybe if you were dealing with something like a new car, uh, the cost might be a much, much more important criteria. But in this case, I have calories as being the most important, sodium being next most important, taste being third important, popping percentage fourth, and cost fifth. Uh, the next thing that we have to do, uh, and you have to read this very carefully in the article, um, is uh, we have to uh, begin to assign, uh, and it just says here, arbitrarily assign uh, raw weights um, to each of the different criteria. 
and uh, it's an arbitrary activity, right? And we're going to use uh, we're going to use the number ten because we're going to start with the number ten because ten is uh, a nice number to multiply by, uh, and it's arbitrary, right? So we're going to start with the number ten. And so uh, what we do is we take the um, worst uh, or lowest ranked item here, which is in this case cost, and we give it the number ten. The other thing, uh, in this case, we've got five criteria. So the author tells us that the best score for the best, uh, all, the highest ranked alternative, which is calories, criteria is just calories, will be 40. So now I've got a range ranging from 10 to 40 uh, for the worst uh, to the best, uh, to the most important, least important to most important. And so what I need to do now is I need to come up with scores in between 10 and 40 for the rest of the criteria. And so uh, when you look at, you go from the fifth most important to the fourth most important, uh, you can see the percent edible is only a little bit uh, distance. It's, in this case, uh, the author um, ranked, uh, weighted it uh, as a 15, uh, which is between 10 and 40. And then the author rated um, taste as 30, which is closer to 40, and then 35 uh, for sodium, which is close to 40. Now, the, the, uh, you'll read about this, and, and the author gives you some uh, reasonably uh, useful description of how to do this, but you'll recognize that what you're trying to do here is you're trying to sort of, uh, if you thought of, say, this line at the top as a continuum, and you thought of uh, 10 uh, at this edge and 40 at this edge, you're trying to make dots along that continuum for each of the different criteria, and you're trying to place the dots depending on how important they are to you. So it's not just that um, that calories is most important and sodium is second most important. It's that both calories and sodium are quite important because you'll notice that 35 is pretty close to 40. Uh, and you'll, But then you'll notice that percent edible is pretty far away from these two most important criteria. It's a 15. So it's really not too important. And what this model sort of tells me is taste is sort of middle important. Um, ed percent edible and serving costs are really not too important and that uh, what is important to me are calories and sodium. Now you don't have to go through all that thought process, uh, but you have to replicate this model. You have to assign these raw weights. Now what you have to do is sum up these, these values here. You get to the number 130. Uh, we don't like numbers that are 130. What we really want is 100 or 100% or in this case uh, 1.0. And so uh, using a formula that you're given in your readings, and I'll show you uh, that I did it on the spreadsheet, uh, we're going to uh, take and divide um, uh, certain values here, uh, and and we're going to produce a percentage, a, a unit, what's called a unitized weight, and that's done through a formula. And I'll show you that formula in a few minutes. And so what it, what we really get down to with the unitized weight, which we'll use in a bit, is we say that uh, that uh, in a sense the cost is 7.7 percent of the total weight. That the calories are 30.8% of the total weight, that the sodium is 26.9% of the, the total weight, that percentage edible is 11% of the weight, and taste is 23% of the total weight. Now what's really, what's really important here is that these numbers here derived from how you spread your numbers in the raw weights. So if you start to change your spread a little bit, if you go back and modify those raw weights a little bit, uh, all of this data will change, and when you mul start to multiply later, you multiply the weights times the scores. Uh, if you've changed the weights, then it's possible that the decision ultimately can be different. Um, the next thing uh, we're going to do, and again, I'll show you this on the spreadsheet a little bit later, is we're going to go back to our original values here, uh, which we can't really use because uh, the cost goes uh, um, from the cost goes from highest being worst to lowest being best. Calories do the same thing, highest being lowest, the worst best. So in other words, these three go from a high number being the worst to low number being best to these two where the, they go from uh, the lowest number being the worst to the highest number being best. So we, we can't use these. We can't multiply these times the, the weights we just came up with. Um, because it would be meaningless, right? We wouldn't be able to understand this. And I'll, I'll prove this to you with a spreadsheet uh, in a few minutes. Now, so what we have to do is we have to convert all of these values here 
into numbers that move in the same direction. And that's the big challenge, right? Um, and so there is a formula that you're given in your article and I'm going to make my spreadsheet available to you as well. Um, and so you're going to be able to uh, use the formula and it looks something like this uh, where you begin to uh, take away um, the actual value here from the worst criteria and you're going to do a little bit of additional work here and then you're going to come up with a, a number between 0 and 100 okay, using that formula. So everything here is calculated using a formula and it is this formula that I just created here and I copied and pasted it everywhere else. And so, um, and so what's happening here is we're taking all of the criteria in the numbering system that we originally entered and we're converting it to a 0 to 100 scale where everything moves from 0 being the worst to 100 being the best. So what we needed to do here uh, that we didn't do in assignment one part two is we put everything moving in the same direction. Once you do that, life gets an, a, a whole lot better. And so you can read about that in the article. I'll show you again how this happens. Uh, it's not magic, but you know if you really dig into this formula, you can start to appreciate how these rescaled values are, are generated. Um, once we get to a point where we've rescaled these values, now instead of having the original values, we now have these rescaled values. Uh, we go back and we multiply them times the, the, the criteria weights that I covered before. So we multiply uh, zero times 7.69%. Uh, we still get any time, anything times zero is zero. Uh, we multiply 7.69% uh, uh, times 50, we get 3.85. And so what we're doing is we're taking each of these scores, we're multiplying them times the weight, and we're getting these new scores, right? So these are now your new weighted scores, just like you did on uh, assignment, assignment one part two, you, where you multiplied the score times the weight. We've done that here as well, but what we've done is we multiplied it times this, this re, uh, reconfigured scoring system. Okay, and then if you uh, do the summation over here, you, look, you add up these uh, weighted uh, scores based on these values here, you can see that you get your ranking. You can barely see it on my screen, um, but you get uh, you you learn that uh, Orville Redenbacher, Scormay Popcorn it is ranked number one. Uh, you learn that Jolly Time is ranked number two, and so on. You can see the ranks over here. Okay, so that's that's the system. So what you had to do with uh, a mal model is you had to eliminate these changes in direction, and that was the big activity or the big initiative. Uh, you also need to conduct sensitivity analysis. Uh, remember what I said to you earlier, if you go back and you start changing these weights a little bit, these raw weights, everything in the model ripples, right? Everything changes. So uh, let's go back and change, uh, instead of this being 35 um, sodium, let's uh, change it to be 38.5, see if our decision changes. Now let's go back and uh, uh, rescale any other score here, uh, instead of uh, um, this being 30, let's make it 31 and let's see if the decision changes. The sensitivity analysis is very important because it enables you to say, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm off a little bit in my thought process here, I could actually come out with a different answer. So how much room do I have before I come out with a different answer? And that's what sensitivity analysis is. So what we covered here was uh, when and why to use a, multi, a MAL model. Uh, you use it when your uh, values move in different directions, when you've mixed qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, we understand how MAL models are different than the basic weighted scoring model, uh, and we looked at the MAL model steps, and we also reconciled the MAL model results, uh, tried to understand them and see how we could use the sensitivity analysis to do that. Oops, and I just hit the wrong button on my computer, so bear with me one second. Get this back up again. <laughs> what I want to show you is, uh, and maybe what I'll do is, uh, I'm going to have to wait for this, is I'll record the rest of this lecture um, as a separate lecture. I gotta get my computer back up here. So uh, stand by, uh, there'll be a second part to tonight's lecture.